Good morning, gang. Let's talk about the <clears throat> economics of sex and maybe some uh, distinctions between the sexes. So I was having a conversation this past week with a friend of mine about uh, different things and the topic of archetypes in masculinity and femininity. This is something I'm interested in. I only have a, a surface level understanding of it, but I know a little bit. And a few weeks ago in a, I think it was a physiology lab at school, like most universities, my university is mostly female. And so the majority of my lab partners, in fact, all but all but two who sit at my row of, of chairs and tables in a, in the laboratory are female and I like to talk about interesting things and most people do once you get past the weather and formalities and things like that sexual market value is something I think is tremendously interesting and tremendously useful and it's not something people talk about or learn um, but it's, it's one of those things that we know intuitively, and it's not until we articulate it or, or we hear it articulated that it becomes true, sort of, in our minds. It's, it's something you feel, and once it's expressed properly, you recognize it instantly. You recognize it as true. And so my friend Stephen was asking me... <clears throat> about the the divine feminine versus the the inverted feminine and the same thing for for masculine roles and I used examples uh, that I've used successfully before to explain this concept from Disney movies children's stories uh, they make the characters pretty obvious uh, who the bad guy is, who the good guy is, who the bad girl is, who the good girl is. Children recognize basically via facial expression or, or symmetry or uh, colors and sounds, tone of voice, instantly they recognize who, who are the good and bad characters. And in these typically male and female roles, there is a, a spectrum of behavior um, and and a group of traits we typically associate with the masculine character or the feminine character. One example of masculinity, uh, I used the same movie for both, the story of Beauty and the Beast. So the masculine character, uh, overtly you have the beast and the prince that the beast becomes. Once, once the feminine counterpart enters the life of the beast, he, he becomes not docile, but closer to uh, docile. He, he doesn't totally cuck, um, but he does become less of a monster when he's confronted with, with a, a properly oriented female. So that's, that's the overt look. And another picture of masculinity you get in that story is the character of Gaston. No one drinks like Gaston. Uh, no one thinks like Gaston. He's the, uh, the domineering alpha rather than the dominant alpha. And there, the distinction there is uh, someone who is dominant doesn't need to dominate other people. You don't need to be domineering. Uh, you don't need to make demands and have, have your orders followed and things like that. That's not the masculine uh, aspect that's in a way it's it's a male uh, exemplifying the inverted female role the need to control things and so Gaston it's it's painted like he's like everyone loves him you know but but who loves him the 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 bimbo character who's in the scene, the, those three girls who are, who are attracted to his, his muscles and, all, and who are attracted to all of the same things that his male peers uh, admire in him. 
and this is where this uh, social selection, sexual selection thing happens. So Gaston is the alpha from the male perspective. He uh, he's big and strong. He's uh, he's broadcasts himself as being brave and uh, uh, you know all all of the things that that would elevate one among men to being the alpha among men. But the problem is that here this this alpha female, Belle, does not recognize him as the alpha. So the female selection process is more selective than the male selection process. All the men got together. All the men in the town recognized that Gaston is it. He's the standard for, for masculinity. He's what all men strive to be. We want to be able to have... Um, a neck is incredibly thick as Gaston. So Gaston moves to the top of the hierarchy. And then the women choose from who, who the men select. So in the same way that we do presidential elections, right? So those candidates have already been selected or they would never make it to the stage. You merely get to elect from those who have been selected. So they put a Jeb Bush in front of you and a Hillary Clinton and a and a Mitt Romney and a, and a Donald Trump and, and these people that they are not the everyman. They don't express the same views as the everyman unless they're doing it to manipulate. They, they are not like you. And they are playing a role of masculinity. Even Hillary Clinton, the presidential pre candidate, is playing a role of masculinity. And hypergamy is exactly right coast. So I'll get into this, this market thing. I've explained already that who the men say is best, the, the men get together, they say, this is the best man. The women will not always recognize that man that you've put forward as the best man. They'll select from the pool, but they're not always going to agree with your choice. They are more selective than the men are. And they're hypergamous men are hypogamous. So female market value, and I'm speaking only in terms of sex. This is base reptile brain drive to, to copy your genes. The conscious and unconscious decisions we're making are based on two things. When a man looks at a woman with the prospect of, of dating, a relationship, marriage, etc., her value is determined by her fertility. And there are an infinite number of markers of that fertility, to name a few, uh, healthy skin, healthy nails, healthy teeth, healthy eyes, healthy hair, um, a proper hip to width ratio. Uh, if she has large breasts, all, all the better, large buttocks, all the better, thick thighs, all the better, uh, good facial symmetry, and no limp or anything, no f f obvious physical deformities or abnormalities. So a, a female's sexual market value is determined by primarily her attractiveness, which is a, a proxy for fertility. All of those signs are universally recognized. It's not culture specific. Uh, narrow bridge of the nose, Fibonacci sequence symmetry in the face, a, a bilaterally symmetrical face, not a lot of droop one side or the other. And all of us have a little bit of asymmetry, but the more symmetrical your face is, the closer you are to a, uh, a Brad Pitt or, uh, I don't know, Angelina Jolie when she was pretty. So that's what determines value for the female is effectively eggs, fertility, eggs. For the man, it boils down to resources and the selection mechanism and the, the proxies that are stand-ins for resource acquisition are intelligence, uh, coordination, uh, ability to articulate thought, so speaking. Um, someone who's good at telling jokes or is funny is, is good at thinking on their feet. Uh, this, another way to approximate this would be dancing. Someone who is able to dance to music and be coordinated and coordinate movements that indicates intelligence, and intelligence is a proxy for um, ability to acquire resources. 
IQ and resource acquisition across time are positively correlated. They're, I mean, I can't say that it's causative, but it's about as close as it gets. So the more intelligent you are, the higher your income is going to be over your life. The higher your level of educational achievement is going to be over your life. The, uh, it's inversely correlated with a number of negative outcomes. You, you're less likely to go to prison. You're less likely to be absent from work or get sick. All cause mortality, all of the reasons that you could die, the higher your IQ is, the lower your likelihood of dying as a general rule. I, I mean, anyway, so your ability to acquire resources and simply put what that means in our material world is how much money do you make or how much money will you make? So there are, there's a network of approximations of my ability to determine what your earning potential is as a man. Do you come from a good family? Do you have both parents? Uh, are your clothes clean? Are, do you do you stand up straight? What is your how is your posture? How is your tone of voice? How do how do your peers interact with you? Are you at the bottom of the totem pole? At the top of the totem pole, etc. Hopefully, you get the point. So, we're we're both status seeking. Female status is based on fertility. Male status is based on resources. There is a, a curve that represents uh, the market value with, um, I don't know, points of sexiness on the y-axis and time in years across the x-axis, so your age. Female sexual market value is effectively zero up to puberty. And at puberty, at the onset of menses, rapid spike almost to uh, to 10 let's say uh, so it's it's going to vary for your level of physical attractiveness but based on your fertility which is the primary driver of sexual selection a female goes from pre menses net zero the male is also at net zero to 10 and the most rapid increase typically is from about age 15 to 22, give or take a few years. Now, obviously, in the West, we think it's a no-go. If you're under 18, it's a no-go. You're still a ward of, of your parents, and uh, if, you're, if you're fucking with girls that young and you're grown, I, I hope you get choked out uh, and killed. So your value rapidly increases to where it's unbelievable how desirable you are at age 22 and you're you're never going to be more attractive than you are right now so if you're a 22 year old female you don't have any kids out of wedlock you maybe you have a job some education um, both your parents are, are in the house they're to, they're together and married you're you're as close to 10 as you're ever going to be and then you get rapid decline in sexual market value because there's a window, right? You have all of the eggs you're ever going to have, you have in the beginning. And then you're spending those eggs with the lunar cycles, right? Every time you, every time you, uh, you ovulate, you just lost another one. And there is a fixed number that you, you have a winnowing sexual market value because it's an exchange of dollars for eggs. So you have until about, given Western medicine, you can conceive up to about age 40. There are exceptions, tales of the distribution that are beyond 40 that have uh, successful pregnancies and, and uh, viable births at that age. But optimum child rearing uh, at a physiological level is going to be maybe fourth fourth menstruation, fifth menstruation. This girl is obviously too young, up to 35, let's say. And, and it's pretty generous here in the West. We have a, a pretty low infant mortality rate because we have good medicine and uh, you get it. So, <clears throat> peak, 
22. You're as close to 10 as you're ever going to be, and then a rapid decline. Down to pretty close to zero um, by the time you're 40. It's unfortunate. I'm sorry. Men start out same place as you, zero, except they don't get the puberty boost. Uh, it's going to start c- climbing gradually as you know they, they gain some physical attraction, uh, physical attractiveness. They're going to uh, start to build a, a peer network, a network of friends, and, and again, that interaction with the friends is a, an approximation to status for status-seeking females. Um, but up to 18, 22, 25, 30, guys are just slowly gaining value. And it's not until late 30s that men have their peak of sexual market value. So for women, it was 22. Men, on average, it's going to be around 30 thick, 30 thick, 36, uh, 37 years old, something like that. By this time, a man has um, a peer group. He's got friends. He's maybe come into his own, uh, as far as his personality development, um, his brain wasn't fully developed physically until about 25. Female brain develops a little earlier, about 22. It's fully developed. So by the, by the time he's in his late 30s, he's accumulated some resources, hopefully, if he's, if he's been doing his job, so to speak, in this material world we live in. That guy is more valuable at 35 than any woman. I mean, assuming she's not a princess um, and you're, you're interested in women for resources instead of fertility. Like, there, there are exceptions to all of these rules. These are just general. So a 35-year-old woman and a 35-year-old man are, are not, e- not even on the same playing field. The optimum age where these intersect is about 30 years old. But given what I've just explained... That is, that is a time of rapid decline in sexual market value for women because their fertility window is closing rapidly at that time. So if, if a man wants a large family, for example, uh, finding and marrying a 30-year-old woman is not going to be in his best interest. Um, if he just wants a friend to, to die with, go for it. You know, nothing wrong with that. So... Back to these, these archetypes. There are, there is the properly oriented masculine, the properly oriented feminine. It's perhaps it is a societal construct, unless um, unless the old philosophers were correct that there is, there exists an abstraction of ideal forms. Uh, I listened to a podcast about Plato yesterday, and he maintained that when you think about the quality of a chair, you're comparing that chair to an ideal chair that exists in your mind. It's not, it's not a rational thing. It's not something you can articulate, but the reason you recognize a chair and the reason you're, you are able to evaluate the quality of that chair is because there is, a, there is a world of ideal forms as a part of your consciousness. You have the perfect chair in your mind and you're comparing any chair you come across to that chair. Does it have, does it, will it hold my weight? Uh, is it visually appealing? Is it uh, soft or firm enough? Whatever. So it's totally subjective, but Plato maintained that it's not, it's not entirely subjective. It's something that exists in the ether, in the collective consciousness. It's something that is in your mind before you're born. Ideal forms are, exist independently of you, and you're able to draw on that information. So whether there's an ideal form for the masculine and feminine remains to be seen. If, if there is, it's going to be subjective, but the evidence suggests that beauty is not subjective. Beauty is universally recognized as facial symmetry and indicators of physical health. So I've I've explained it already. I won't explain it again. 
that is true in India. It's true in Bangladesh. It's true in Sri Lanka. It's true in Russia. It's true in the U.S. It's true in South America. It's true everywhere. Signs of fertility and physical health. These Disney characters, again, if you want to think of the the divine feminine versus the inverted feminine, a story like Snow White. Snow White is an idealized version of the feminine. That would be one of the, the ideal forms Plato talks about, or as close an approximation to it as possible. She's kind, she's generous, she's pretty, she is friendly, she can sing, uh, she, she knows uh, the traditional role uh, of the female. Uh, she's somewhat submissive, but still advocates on her own behalf, so she's not a pushover. Um, a, a million characteristics, but picture Snow White as the ideal form for the feminine. Likewise, the inversion of that female form is going to be the witch, right? The one who curses her. The one who, when she ventures out into the world, uh, poisons her and makes her fall asleep. She becomes unconscious of herself. And that unconsciousness is, is an unawareness of femininity. She, she falls asleep and can't recognize who she, who she is. She's, she's unconscious. And even these personality types, all of these uh, incomplete men, so sleepy, dopey, grumpy, bashful, blah, blah, blah. They all have their vices, right? So these are incomplete men and none of them are able to resurrect the female. They can't pull the female back out of chaos. This witch, the inversion of the feminine, the the vindictive, spiteful, uh, Oedipal mother, that person inflicted uh, a loss of consciousness onto Snow White, onto the feminine form. So the, the divine feminine has collapsed. And none of these men can can rebuild that feminine form because they're incomplete. One of them's sleeping all the time. One of them's just a dope. One of them, you know, he, I don't know what Doc's deal is. I guess he uh, he seems like an all right dude. I, I don't know what the problem is with Doc. Maybe I need to watch it again. But who is able to resurrect the feminine? Well, the divine feminine emerges in opposition to the, the divine masculine. And so what happens in the story? I, I don't know if this happens in the Disney version. I, so the prince comes, finds Snow White, right? She's asleep. She's unconscious, unaware of herself. And with, with a kiss or a, I think in the story it's a spell or something. I don't think it's a kiss that does it. But resurrects the feminine. Why is he able to do that? Because he's a complete man. He's, he's the self-actualized man. He's not sleepy or dopey or bashful or lazy or grumpy or an asshole. He's not the domineering alpha like Gaston. He's not a prick. He's not uh, arrogant. He's not any of those things. Self-absorbed. He's not, uh, he's not the inversion of the masculine. He's the divine masculine. He's able to resurrect Snow White because he's complete. And it, it's, it's, it's mirroring the, the Beauty and the Beast story because the Beast is the inverted man, right? He's, he's, he's the male version of Snow White sleeping. He's been put to sleep with a, with a curse, right? That woman who comes to his door uh, asks for respite, offers him a rose, I think, and that rose represents now his his masculinity, which is withering away and needs to be resurrected. So he's, he's dead too. He's asleep. He, he's, he's forgotten who he is or what he is. That's, that's the, the inversion of the man. So he's, he's filled with rage and hostility and resentment and all of the, like there are many characteristics that, that parallel one another with the, the, the inverted masculine, inverted feminine. The Snow White story, that resurrection, the, the, the properly oriented masculine form draws that feminine out of the muck. And now the, the perfect union, that, that yin and yang, the, the balance, the harmony can, can take place. This is, this is the story. It's the story. All the stories are this story. 
the, the masculine, that beast, is transformed by the properly oriented Belle who enters the castle, right? She, she, she assumes the risk of entering the castle, rescues her father, so she's doing what's typically the masculine role, but it's because she is, she is properly oriented. That's why she doesn't go for Gaston, because Gaston, she recognizes instantly that Gaston is weak. He, he is not the masculine. He's simply the person that all the men think is masculine because he's deceived them. He's, he's a psychopath, in fact. He's highly intelligent, but manipulative. This is uh, Christian Bale in American Psycho. Bell enters the castle and resurrects and, and wakes up the sleeping man. That's, that's what she's doing. Snow White and Beauty and the Beast are the same story with, with the sexes reversed. It's no coincidence that the man in the story, they can't do away with the, the status, with the approximation of status for the man. It's wealth. The beast has a castle. The, the prince has a castle. The female, they can't do away with the feminine archetype. The female is young, beautiful, fertile. So there are certain things you can't detach from the archetype. These are the core of sexual market value. And we can try and invert it because social justice and all that shit. But those stories aren't going to work. There's something to that idea of the ideal form. I don't think Plato got it right. And and listen how arrogant I am 2,000 years after the fact. I don't think he got it right because... I... These ideas aren't something that I can draw out and show you. I can't measure this and show it to you. I can give you the, the preponderance of the evidence, the, the universal uh, fertility standards or, or beauty standards. I can give you evidence about male and female hypergamy and, and hypogamy. I can, give you, I can give you all kinds of statistics that are around the problem that I'm pointing to or the, the thing that I'm pointing to. It's not necessarily a problem. It's worked for what, six billion years? The point being, that idea of sexual market value, eggs for resources, as long as you get that right, you can tell whatever story you want around it. The second aspect of that story is order from chaos, or to have chaos. The, the character leaves the safety and security of their home, has an adventure. That adventure results in some climactic, chaotic, dramatic moment. That moment is transformative for the character or an auxiliary character. That transformation unites the, the properly oriented masculine and feminine, and that is what permits creation. Creation, the, the continuation of life being the highest ideal, I think. I, maybe there's something higher than that. Maybe there's a perfect form for that perfect form. The, per, the perfect union of the masculine and feminine, maybe there is an idealized form for that. If you can have a fully self-actualized masculine and a fully self-actualized feminine, and they, they give birth to a child who is um, the archetypal hero. From, from the onset, he's, he's a hero. He comes out uh, with a sword and shield and is also uh, proselytizing for non-aggression. <laughs> so he has the sword, but it's sheathed. This is the, the meek man who's going to inherit the earth. I don't think there, there was anything else I wanted to mention about that. I can, it was funny because I'm, I'm sitting at a table with four, five, six, seven, with seven girls at it and two guys at the end. And I'm, I'm laying this thing out and, and drawing, uh, drawing my X, Y axis and the graphs with the intersections and stuff like that for, for sexual market value. And they're enthralled. And I, it, it blew my mind that people would be that interested in something. Um, 
I'm I'm naturally charismatic and I like to talk so I I've been talking to these these kids all semester about different things and none of them had ever heard of this why is that a problem <clears throat> Should I even get into this? I'll keep it brief. Declining fertility rates in the West. So Western nations, Christian nations, are the freest, cleanest, and best nations on earth. If if, if the best house in the neighborhood collapses, there's nowhere to go but down. Hopefully that makes sense. Declining fertility rates among native women in these Western European nations and Christian nations generally is a problem because those are the people who built these nations. If there are characteristics that are implicit in, in that type of person, a loss of that type of person is going to result in a loss of the type of society that they built. And it's not just Northeast Europe, that specific person builds this kind of society. But everywhere that specific person has gone, they have built something that approximates an English common law, individual right oriented society. The freest and best and richest and most prosperous societies on earth. Young women are the future of society. You have twice as many female ancestors as you have male ancestors. Why? Because women are more successful at reproduction than men reliably. Because women are more desirable. They're, they're a hotter commodity. You, what, Dave Chappelle has a bit about this. I think he's, he's talking about women uh, either going to the club or or maybe it was an online thing I can't recall and I'm going to butcher it sorry Dave Chappelle women are swimming through a sea of dicks just getting hit in the face with dicks and he does it, does the sound with the microphone and he has comedic timing and stuff that I don't have but they're swimming through a sea of dicks um, you can see this in the statistics from eHarmony, Match.com, and Tinder. So one of these sites does rankings uh, where you're, you're effectively rating the sexual attractiveness of a prospective mate that's being put in front of you. And the overwhelming majority of men are ranked as significantly low in attractiveness, whereas from the male perspective, the majority of women are at the average of attractiveness. So your typical man sees a woman, average woman, is likely to rate her as a five. Typical woman sees a typical man, both average. The woman is likely to rate that man at a two or a three, with only about 1% of males rating in the nine to 10 category. So it's a, it's, it's a skewed distribution to the left, whereas male uh, perception of beauty or sexual market value for women based only on the visual is a normal distribution with the, the mean at the center. <clears throat> Female hypergamy is what drives society forward. Because, as I've said, men choose the best men, and then women choose from among the best men who they're going to have children with, typically. If we're having 1.8 children for every couple, every household, we are not having enough children to replace the population. This decline in birth rates means the end to that species almost every time throughout history. That, that race is going to be outbred by other races that are replacing their population by producing more than two children per household. These young women who had never considered sexual market value, 
these young men who had never considered sexual market value. It's not as much of a problem for the men because their market value is based on their ability to acquire resources. But these young women who are 22, 23, 24 years old, who are not thinking about marriage, they're thinking about graduate school and then putting in 10 years working for a law firm or for a, a research company or for so, doing something that is typically a masculine pursuit are bypassing the peak of their fertility window, their peak of attractiveness, their peak of um, viable eggs, their peak of desirability from the, the their opposite sex counterparts perspective. They're bypassing that chasing Audis and shit. I want money. I want status. I want whatever. This lust for the material is is nowhere more clear in my mind. I've used this example before probably. I know I have in conversation. Hip-hop. You look at hip-hop. I listen to hip-hop. I shouldn't because it's, it's low frequency and it's bass, but fuck it. Fuck you. What is male sexual market value from the hip-hop perspective? You look at the, the catalog in its entirety. Canonical work of, let's say, top 40 hip-hop. Look at all these things I have. Look at the things that are on me. Look at the thing that I drive. Look at the thing that I live in. Look at all these things that I have that you don't have. Things. Stuff. Things. Stuff. Material. Vapor. You're getting a caricature of male sexual market value. And what comes with that caricature? A caricature of masculinity. I've eliminated the courage, the dominance, the bravery, the strength, the all of it, all of it. The, the positive, actualized, masculine hero. I've eliminated everything implicit in that in favor of the thing that determines your sexual market value, money. Today money the female perspective <clears throat> sexual market value is determined by fertility so what do we see from the female in hip hop culture again top 40 you can look at male hip hop artists female hip hop artists look at their videos I have front and center large breasts hip to waist ratio, facial symmetry, and fertility on full display. Stare at my pussy. Look at my titties. Look at my ass. Look how fertile I am. Sex, 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 sex. This is what's selling. So again, here, and I won't skip this. It just came up in my mind. This is the most damaging part. You have decreased the value of a woman to just her ability to procreate. And not just that, the appearance of her ability to procreate. So now, I can have a male stand-in for a female character that exemplifies the feminine standard. I can have a guy with a dick in a bathing suit with fake titties fake ass fake face whatever and that is no less real as an approximation to female sexual market value than a female is you've reduced everything to the visual in the same way you've done it for the masculine so what are we looking at here we're looking at the Seven Dwarves version, the No One Drinks Like Gaston version of the masculine and the feminine. 
I have dollars and titties. You don't need to be masculine to accumulate material wealth. You don't need to be masculine to have a fat bank account and a Gucci belt. You don't need to be masculine for any of those things. You don't need to be feminine to have big titties and a fat ass. You don't need to be feminine to let dudes fuck you and leave you. That's not femininity. Sorry. (laughs) If that's a dated perspective, it's because it's four billion years old. You arrogant fuck. We are... We are destroying archetypes. We are collapsing the pyramid without a plan to rebuild it. And without understanding why the pyramid was constructed the way it was in the first place. I wish I could explain this more clearly and more succinctly than I am. But I don't have, I don't have the ability to do it, I don't think. So I have to use these stories and metaphors. Maybe I'm not as smart as I think I am. Let's see what you guys have. Hypergamy. Correct ghost. I think I touched that natural selection. Well, it's... It's natural and artificial selection. So it, the selection mechanism is natural, but that nature is shaped by propaganda. It's shaped by the expectations of the peer groups and those expectations can be artificial artificially generated so yes humans are na- are natural our environment is natural but because we have free will we can impose we we can yeah in, it, well we can inject artificial stimulus into that selection process i do this with art art is the most powerful form of propaganda. Memes, uh, paintings, music, video, television, film. You get it. Market ages like milk. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, women age like milk and, and men age like wine. It's, that's, it's nature. The horrifying reality of nature is, is when you realize that... Here's something people don't think about. By the age 18, or, or by the time you graduate high school, you will have spent 80% of the time you will ever spend with your parents again for the rest of your life. Reality. It's fucked up. There's hope in the future. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe there is. Um... If we don't, so I mentioned it briefly, the the uh, demographic replacement of the people who built Western society. If we don't get these numbers up, it's a loss. It may already be a loss, and so now it's just a matter of preserving the the system that's in place to prevent America from looking like. South Africa, where once the native population has enough power to exert political influence over another race that they perceive to be inferior or, or superior or whatever, that becomes a real problem for the minority population. It's, I consider myself an optimist, despite the, uh, the horrifying realities that I talk about and think about. I think it can be turned around, but I think we have to start acknowledging reality and be willing to talk about reality if we're going to change reality. So we can't, we can't keep, I can't think of an analogy. We're, we're pointing at a thing that isn't the problem or it, it's auxiliary to the problem. It's a symptom rather than the cause of the illness. So we're pointing out symptoms and bitching about those symptoms and having polarized non-argumentative debates about the symptoms and no one is willing to put their finger on the cause. And as soon as someone does put their finger on the cause, all the people who have 
devoted their lives to arguing about the symptoms and have made arguing about the symptoms a part of their identity are instantly met with that cognitive dissonance. Fuck, my reality is a lie. I better, I better reject and prosecute and persecute this person who has just pointed out the lie that my life has become. And that's, that's, it's nowhere more clear than when people become violently emotionally triggered by words. As soon as something doesn't confirm my biases, I'm outraged. Uh, you get this with conservatives when you, when you question our allegiance to Israel. And you get this with, uh, with the progressives when you say, well, yes, I, I agree that the poor need to be taken care of, but is it right to put a gun to the heads of the rich in order to do that? And uh, I'm not doing that. Okay. I, I'm optimistic, but given the focus on sub reality, I don't know that, that that's, uh, it's not, it's not going to be easy. I'll say that. Stefan unloads on Plato halfway through. Don't worry if you knock Plato too. Yeah. So I, I listened to, I, I don't think I finished like the last half hour of that podcast, but yeah, Plato's a faggot. And, uh, I, I said this to my friend Paul and he said, yeah, well, Nietzsche said that, you know, 60 years ago. So it's, it's not exactly profound wisdom. Plato is saying that, well, I actually took notes on it. So briefly, Plato is a, Plato's a fascist, right? You're, you're not going to hear that sentence from anyone calling Plato a philosopher or using his ideas as a, a justification for how we should construct our, our utopia. How, how the republic should be run because Plato advocated for a three-part system of governance um, and this would be a slave class a warrior class and a philosopher king class and these strata are identified Evola talks about the same thing in a little bit more detail you can be sort of inducted into the higher orders most people are slaves, obviously, with the second largest part of the population being in the warrior class, your, your soldiers, infantry, etc. And then you have the, the elite. What determines the elite? Well, their ability to uh, recognize the ideal form. Okay, what's the ideal form? Well, it's subjective. Okay, so how do we know who recognizes the ideal form if it's subjective? Well, they'll just know, and they'll be better at knowing than you are. Okay. So that's what puts people into the upper echelon of society and gives them the authority that's endowed by this, this subnet reality that gave them the ability to recognize true form. That gives them authority over me. You think this gives you power over me? Hashtag Bane. So he's, he's for a totalitarian fascist meritocracy hysterical I I know it wouldn't work and even though I would benefit from it I'm not into it Plato it it's a good try you're a smart dude but you can't you can't use an abstraction that no one can measure as a as a way to structure society unless that unless that measure has proven reliably true across time i don't know how we can just collapse the current thing to replace it with a thing that we can't look at let's see i was laughing at the sea of dicks yeah it's dave chappelle does it a lot a lot funnier than i do uh he well he's a master comedian and i'm not you guys have a good day we'll see you